Hey guys, check this out. I got a special announcement for you. We came up with an idea of having sort of another Q&A, but we decided to flip the script. And that is have me ask you guys questions and you submit your answers via a short video clip in regards to watches. And I don't care if you own a $50 watch or a $500,000 watch. What I would like to do is ask you guys a question and in return you reply via video. So I'm gonna come up with different questions every week for everyone collect my submissions. Ian, we'll put it all together. We'll throw it out there for you viewing pleasure. So my first question to you, my audience, show me your favorite watch. Tell me what it is that made you buy that particular watch or why is it your favorite watch? Try to keep your submissions under a minute. Below, you're gonna find Ian's email. You can email those videos directly to Ian. If you choose to stay anonymous, you can do so by just simply videotaping the watch and talking over. So I have the audio telling me what you're doing. If you don't wanna stay anonymous, you're welcome to show your face. I'd love to meet my audience. Audience. We're welcome to include any and all social media links that you have. We'll certainly credit you. I will look forward to your submissions. And once in the blue moon, I can put together a compilation of what my viewers think in regards to certain topic when it comes to horology. Uh, this is a Q&A, so hold on a second. Ugh. I think I'm ready. Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. First question is from Martin Newton, a uh, long time viewer of my channel. I see questions from him all the time and comments pretty much on every episode. So Martin asks, over the past two years, I've managed to acquire a couple of pieces from FB Journe, a chronometry blue plus a chronometry Sauveron in platinum. I think it would be fair to say that Mr. Journe's reputation as a watchmaker is formidable and his reputation as a bit of a French maverick also adds to his mystique. However, he's approaching his formative years and I wanted to get your opinion as to where you think the value of the watches made during his work life will be when he eventually hangs up his loop and dons his slippers. Do you think these models will appreciate in future greatly? Great show, you educate me and make me laugh heartily every week, keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Martin, first and foremost. And this opens up a very broad topic, not just in regards to F.P. Journe. Rule of thumb is that a well-respected watchmaker, had it be, rather it be uh, Mr. Journe, whether it was Gerald Genta who has since passed away, unfortunately. Odds are the watches will become collectible. What will become collectible is the pieces that he made originally. Some of his older stuff will certainly be very, very collectible. However, it's not necessarily true, unfortunately. And the reason for that is because even after Mr. Journe goes away, the company will not go away. He has a slew of watchmakers uh, that are there. Uh, I mentioned uh, Rex, Rex Heppy worked for him at one time or the other. He ran a team of like 12 people. So obviously there is an assembly line there of sorts. And I don't know how much hands-on Mr. Jordan gets onto actually assembling these pieces. He probably just creates a particular piece and then it gets assembled by someone else. Again, not sure on that. But if the company continues on going, it really depends on the popularity of the, of the company going forward after his retirement, let's say. I'll give you a good example. The Jumbo Royal Oak that I wear, the one that was originally created by Gerald Denta from 1972, this was not a $60,000 watch. Uh, five, 10 years ago. In fact, Royal Oaks 10 years ago weren't as collectible as they are today. Right now they're on fire. And the reason the older stuff has gone up in price is because the new modern stuff is super hot. You'd be hot pressed to pick up 15400 or a plain Royal Oak or a Royal Oak chronograph on the retail. They're all trading at overlist. And that actually contributes to the fact that the older stuff is more popular. Same thing happens with Rolex. Older Daytonas, the, the, some of the Daytonas that are trading at a quarter million dollars right now, 10 years ago, were trading at $50,000. It's all about the current hype and what's going on currently in the market. Let's say tomorrow F. Bijorn comes out with some kick-ass collectible watch, and all of a sudden, this thing is trading at double its retail value, like some of the paddocks that are out there. 5711, again, by the way, created by, uh, by Genta. What will that do to his other pieces, especially the older pieces? All of a sudden, they become that much more attractive. While a particular respected, well-respected watchmaker like Mr. Jordan retires, yes, it will have some sort of an effect on his pieces, but not necessarily make him go through the roof just because the guy is no longer there. In fact, it can have a negative effect. It may make the value of their pieces actually even go down. But for the most part, the older the better, as I always say. The company will continue staying the way they are. There's a certain cult following for F.P. Journe. Those guys will continue following them. And it's really going to be depending on how big the market is. The market on Journe watches is not humongous in comparison to, let's say, that of the AP Royal Low Climb market. When you take a market that's this big and you take, then you take a market of F.P. Journe that's probably this big in comparison, odds are the value of those watches will not go up significantly because there's not a whole lot of guys out there that are huge Jordan fans in comparison to some of the other things that are out there. Hope that someone makes sense. Next question comes from Josh Lewis Hamilton. 
Hi, Roman. Great show. Really enjoy the information you give. Thank you. My name is Josh from the UK. I recently picked up a Rolex at Mariner 16610 2010Z serial. I've been told this is a unique watch because of the year and the serial, and it's worth a little more than a normal sub. Can you please explain why and as to how much more? Keep up the good work. Honestly, I'm going to give you a general answer as well, and not just in regards to your sub, but in regards to many Rolexes. It's a matter of how many pieces were actually made during a certain production period. And usually what you find with subs, for example, is you have these transitional subs when they went from one model to another. And usually those models are made for a short amount of time. Therefore, there were less of them made, therefore less of them out there and available, and less demand can be met. So therefore, those watches tend to be worth more. I talked about P-Serial Daytonas, specifically the first quarter of the P-Serial, which is 2001. And I said, in that very first quarter, they made the least amount of P-Serial Daytona, which is why a stainless steel Daytona, the previous version, in a P-Serial is the most expensive one. Prior to that would be the A-Serial Daytonas, which is the last official year of Zenith movement production, right? There's a ton of Zenith Daytonas out there. You know, they made it for quite a few years. However, there's only so many first year productions and so many last year productions, and then you have that little space in between, which is what happened with the Daytona, that, P, that first quarter of that year where they made the least amount of those Daytonas. And same goes for your sub and many other subs. A lot of guys get out there and they collect what's called transitional Samaritans, and those are the Samaritans where you, they were making one model, then they went to a different one, and then they perfected it and they started making another model for a longer period of time. Those traditional models that you know may have been only produced for a year or two years or maybe a half a year, those are the ones that tend to be worth a little bit more money in the collector's eyes and which is why they're trading a little bit higher. If I'm somebody that's specializing in vintage watches, I'm going to find every single possibility out there to make my product a little bit more special. It's a matter of how much is out there. And this is the case with your particular Submariner. And usually, typically, those watches tend to be worth 10 to 20% more than, then, say, the next model over or the next model behind it that was maybe made for 10 years versus this one being made for two years. And that's really all it comes down to. Hope that answers your question. Next question comes from Jukebox. Uh, let's talk about somewhat successful watch car partnership, JLC and Austin Martin comes to mind anymore. I think that the fact that the watch is generally well made and not just a sticker plaster makes a big difference. Yes and no. Jaeger LaCulture and Austin Martin have had a successful relationship for a while. If you do remember, they didn't just come out with a watch that boasted the Austin Martin logo and said Austin Martin on and therefore here's a relationship, buy it, right? Much like, uh, let's say, Ferrari did with Gerard Perigo. There was a little bit of an oomph to the watch when it came out. If you remember the chronograph of the Austin Martin, it, it had no push buttons. What did you have to push to set the chronograph? The actual crystal of the watch, which is very innovative. It was first of its kind. Very James Bond-like, and a lot of people associate Austin Martin with James Bond, although it's not really tied to James Bond. But automatically in the back of your hand, you see Austin Martin. The first thing you think about is, if you're a Bond fan like myself, is Bond. James Bond. One of the more successful car watch collaborations would be Breitling and Bentley. If you own a Bentley and if you've ever seen a Bentley, Bentley has a Breitling clock inside its models. And there's a huge line of Breitling Bentleys and they were always popular. Uh, the reason they were popular is they came out, the timing was very, very right. When they came out with the first one with the stainless steel band, it was a big bulky watch. This is when this stuff was becoming popular and it was very, very affordable. It retailed prices in the 5,000s. And till this day, they still continue making those models. People continue buying them, whether they're a Bentley owner or not. I do know for a fact, a lot of Bentley owners will get out there and buy themselves a Breitling Bentley watch just because a lot of guys that tend to own fancy cars, they also tend to own fancy watches. I've seen this go hand in hand. And for somebody who's out there buying himself a Bentley, arguably probably not his first car, probably a second or a third car, they'll get out and say, wait a minute, for $5,000, I should pick up this Breitling to sort of go with my car. As I'm driving my Bentley, I have the same matching clock as I do on my wrist, and that makes it really cool. So that's another successful one. I think Hublot currently is doing well with Ferrari. I've answered a question in one of the previous Q&As, is, is the Ferrari a curse for watches? And, uh, you know, I did say that it was somewhat of a curse for GP. Uh, I also said it was a curse for Panerai, but I think Hublot is actually doing extremely well with the Ferrari partnership that they're doing now. And uh, some of the newer models that I reviewed in the Basel episode I just did, I think made some really kick-ass models. The the Turbian that they made, I mean, that, that it looks like a Ferrari engine, you know what I mean? The La Ferrari, I mean, it's, it's an amazing watch. And uh, people get out there, they want to buy that watch. Some of their, uh, you know, more down to earth, cheaper models uh, that, that, that they made, the new models they made this year, they did an outstanding job. With Gerard Perigo, it was, it was more of a regular production watch with a Ferrari logo slapped on it or a sticker, as you may have mentioned it, although they used the actual logo. And 
just didn't really see anything exciting or anything that would differentiate from the other models. Where if you look at some of the Hublot Ferraris, they are really, really different. There's a lot of thought to make you feel like you have a Ferrari on your wrist. And they've been doing well with it, so that would probably be another one. I'm sure there's more, but uh, I think uh, the three that I mentioned should uh, suffice to answer your question. I hope that helps. I'm gonna take one more, and this is a long question, but we'll have a fairly short answer. This one is from J. Hugh Dell. I hope I got that right. Hey Roman, thank you for your continuous content and hard work. I love how you could easily not do YouTube videos and still be super successful, but choose to anyways. Thank you for your work and I hope you never lose the drive to help us out there who are relatively new to the watch culture. Um, let me address that. First of all, thank you for the kind words. I chose to do YouTube and I've said this numerous times, not to drive traffic to my website, which it does, not to create more sales, which it still does. I did it because I looked, what, I looked at what's out there and I found the watch community on YouTube extremely boring extremely unentertaining and extremely disinformative and they were all sort of geared towards don't mention what I just said. I enjoy doing these. I can talk watches all day with people around the office with a lot of my friends. But YouTube opened up an opportunity for me to talk to millions of people hopefully eventually once my subscriber count goes up. And that's why I continue doing what I do every single week. I'm a fairly busy guy. Between traveling all the time and running a hundred million dollar company, I don't have a whole lot of open slots in my days. If you guys look at my can, it looks like a nightmare oftentimes with appointments overlapping. But I still choose to take three to four hours out of my week and dedicate it to YouTube because this is something I truly, truly enjoy. What makes me enjoy it even more is uh, stuff like this. When I get feedback from my viewers, when I get questions asked, and when I get that interaction going, even though you guys are halfway across the world, it's really great. So on to your question. Me and my family are going to Tokyo, Japan in a few months, and me and my dad are planning to buy a watch for him since the first great watch he's actually bought was just a couple of months ago and was given to me as a gift. I've been falling through the rabbit hole ever since. I've been doing all kinds of research on what watch to get and found myself deciding if a steel Rolex is a good buy right now with its increased price or if we should decide on other alternatives which are around the same price. I know and I believe in buy what you want, but since me and him are relatively new to the watch game, I'm looking for any added information to make sure all of the bases are covered and we end up picking a watch that will fuel our young watch addictions. For references, I've gotten in two possibilities based on his preferences, work, which is military. At age of 51, the Sea Dweller 116, uh, 116600, the 40 millimeter for around 11K, and a sub 14060 for around 7K. Any other suggestions it will be great help. Thank you again, and love from the Philippines. With thousands and thousands of different watches out there, especially in the price range that you're describing, I think you should just take a different approach. Ask yourself a question, what are you looking for in the watch? If you're looking for somebody to recognize that you have a fancy watch, look no further than Rolex. And between the two that you told me, again, there's a big price difference. And then there's obviously the difference between the Sea Dweller and uh, the regular sub and one you can dive further in, right? Uh, now you're a big diver. If you're a big diver and that's important to you and you're going to dive in that watch, then by all means, obviously go with the seed well. Otherwise, save some money and go for the regular sub. As I was saying, look from a different perspective. What is it that you're looking for in the watch? As a novice watch collector, ask yourself, what do you see your collection in 10 years? What do you see your collection in 20 years? How many watches do you think you'll have in your collection? And how do you want to diversify that collection? If your stuff is purely based on investment, uh, don't speculate because I've told you guys before these are expensive toys just so happens that the Rolex market happens to be hot today It can be cold just the same uh, two years from now and you're not in control of that Who's in control of that is the company themselves depending on how much they produce and then uh, the market gets shifted by guys like us, right? So in 10 years if you imagine yourself having a diversified collection What are you gonna base that on? Are you gonna base that on complications movements brands old versus new? Are you gonna diversify within the Rolex line alone? Samarina, GMT, Daytona, etc, etc Or do you want to step out outside the Rolex zone and go to multiple different brands? Do some reading. You know, my episodes are nearly not enough in terms of history of a lot of these companies. And every single manufacturer out there has their history outlined right on their own website. And there's plenty of blogs out there that you can read in regards to the history of the companies. Do you want to stick with just iconic pieces in your collection? Every single brand has an iconic piece in it. I've talked about various brands, brands like such as Corm, quite a few iconic pieces under their belt. So does Paddock, so does Rolex, so does IWC, Eagle Culture, or Panera, any one of those big guys out there, they all have a lot of history behind them. And every single one of them has some sort of an iconic piece in their lineup. The Corum Bubble I talked about, right? Not too big deal of a watch, but guess what? They're the only ones that make that kind of watch. Uh, same goes with their Golden Bridge. And I keep jumping back to Corum because I just did that episode. I'll link it up there, you guys can check that out. But there's a lot of iconic pieces within there. Or maybe you'll find a particular collection within the brand, like myself, for example, I'm a big AP fan. And what am I a fan of? I'm a fan of the Royal Oak Collection. 
I'm also a big fan of military watches. So anytime I get my chance to get on a vintage piece that's military, like the Type 20 I'm trying to buy, still I haven't bought it yet, but I'm working on one, right? Then that's what I'm going for because I want to have a few military vintage pieces in my collection. Technically, I have a collection of a thousand watches, but I don't. This is my business. So these are the things you need to be looking at. This is my best advice to you as a novice collector or anybody else out there. Look into the future and ask yourself a question. What do I want my collection to look like? And what am I going to base my collection on? What are the factors that are important to me? And I feel like that's the best way to look at when you're trying to add something to your collection. Hope that answers your question. Well, guys, that's it for me for today. Don't forget what I said in the beginning. I really want to get this uh, series going with me asking you guys questions. I think I asked a pretty simple question in the beginning. This is sort of my way of getting back to you. And at the same time, perhaps give my viewers some of the exposure should they choose to have exposure. And at the same token, sort of have this feel more like you guys are sitting in the room in front of me, not the camera that I'm looking at as we speak. Hit the like button if you like this video. Hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed. And I'll see you guys next Tuesday.